Hey everyone, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. Uh, tonight's show is going to be all about quail genetics. Um, with us tonight is Tamara Roselle from uh, Australia. Uh, so get Good your morning. pencil and paper ready and uh, get ready to take some notes. Uh, the show is going to run until 8 p.m. So get your questions in early uh, so we can get to all of them. And we may, we may go a little bit over tonight, uh, just depending on how many questions you got. Um, it's going to be a really interesting to topic, so I don't really want to miss anything. Uh, if you would, please type the letter Q in front of your question. Uh, that just helps us distinguish the comments from the questions. Uh, on this show, we don't read all the comments. We only read the questions. Uh, but before we get started, I do have a couple quick announcements that I'd like to make. Uh, Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over on the Caternix Corner Facebook group page. Uh, we have Caternix Quail 101, which is hosted by uh, Kristen Kugel and Nicole Winkles. It is a topic-based live stream, and that is geared towards the beginners. So if you're new to quail and you have questions, they've got a lot of good content over there. Uh, you can go check that out. Uh, also tonight, we're going to be giving away a uh, Caternix Corner uh, Tumblr. And that is going to go to the person who asked the most engaging question of the evening for tomorrow. So uh, that should be really interesting. So stick around to the end of the show and uh, see if you uh, won that. Um, also, uh, we got a new thing that we're going to be doing every week. It's something really simple, but we're going to be doing a shout out uh, to anyone who sends me a photo of their setup and uh, their name and where they're located. Uh, so this week's shout out goes to Steve Hogan from Tennessee. Uh, he says, our little quail corner just getting started and already up to 66 quail. And he has 25 to 30 more on their way, thanks to my Shire Farm. So uh, thanks, Steve, for that. Um, also, our moderator is Verna Young, and she kind of keeps things straightened out in the chat room. And uh, I appreciate that. So, Berna, welcome. Um, okay, that's about it for the announcements. Oh, another thing, uh, June 15th next week, we have uh, Heather Cole. Uh, she's going to be on the show, and she's going to be talking about the new Winola Ranch cage setups. So uh, that's going to be another interesting show to check out. So with that, guys, let's go ahead and get the show started. Welcome to the show, Tamara. Oh, sorry. <laughs> She's enjoying her Good coffee, morning. guys. So. <laughs> yes, I am. It's early. It, yeah, it's like, what? Well, well, it's this time over 7 a.m. over in Australia, correct? Yep. Okay, perfect. If yep. you would, real quick, Tamara, um, just tell the guys a little bit about yourself and where you're from and whatnot. Um, I'm from country Victoria. I live in Western Australia now. I went to RMIT in Melbourne, um, studied cell biology and genetics. Um, I've been in farming all my life. Uh, I used to breed black Hamburgs, um, gold and silver Hamburgs, um, and I've had quail for about 10 years. Perfect. Okay, um, what we're going to do tonight, guys, I am going to turn the stage over to Tamara. She is going to go through um, her talk on quail, and when she's finished, we'll go ahead and uh, take your questions. So, Tamara, you got it. Okay, good morning guys. Um, I am denied for quite a while about how to present this, whether to do something like what you would do at a university and I've decided to cut it down to everyday terms because otherwise I think everybody would have been left more confused than before. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through some common terms that you all would have seen, especially if you're um, on the genetics page. Uh, so I'm going to start with genotype, which is the unobserv unobservable characteristics. Um, so that's what makes up the bird, but what you can't see. The next one is phenotype, which is the observable characteristics. That's what you do see. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about what you're actually looking at in the bird. Allele is the, the mutation form. It's basically the gene. So EB, extended brown, fawn, sparkly, and so on. 
and at each allele goes in a locus. Um, this is the one that confuses people. Uh, it's a locus is a gene loca location. Uh, all genes have one. Um, the next one is heterozygous. This is one copy of an allele on a locus. So it's one copy of the gene on its location. Each location can have two genes, two copies of a gene, and two copies of the gene is homozygous. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking the two different phenotypes in um, autosomic, honest, uh, bleh, sorry, <laughs> autosomal co-dominant, ah, sorry, incomplete dominant. Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> and it's too um, early in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I haven't finished my coffee yet. Um, yeah, so we've got three it. different common modes of inheritance um, that we, we talk about a lot. Uh, the first is autosomal, autosomal incomplete dominant. Um, this is something that blends with the underlying mutation. Um, I'm going to give plenty of examples later on. I just want to cover these terms that we see all the time when we're talking sure. about colors. Um, so autosomal incomplete dominant blends with the underlying, underlying mutation. It changes it in heterozygous and then it changes it again in homozygous. So uh, a common example would be fawn, which is the, the gene, which is on the Y locus. When we've got one copy of fawn, we have an Italian. When we've got two, we have Manchurian. Um, next is recessive. This is when um, the, the gene doesn't express in heterozygous at all. Um, so you need one copy from both parents to express as a phenotype. And that's why I covered phenotype first because, um, yeah. Um, so today basically, if what I'm going to concentrate on is the five basic principles of inheritance. So I'm going to use those terms quite a lot. Genotype, phenotype, heterozygous and homozygous. <coughs> Sorry, I've got my list in front of me. The first one is heterozygous. Ah, also take notes on this because if you guys can remember these five basic principles, you'll be able to work out exactly what you're going to get every time. Um, that seems to be the most common question is, why did this happen? Why did this pop up when I've got, you know, two different p colored birds and, and something else has come up? Um, I receive so many questions all the time about this and, and this is going to hopefully um, clear all of this up. So we've got the five basic principles of inheritance. The first one is heterozygous cross non whatever that color is. So we'll just assume that it's ferro. We'll assume that our non that color is ferro. So we're going to go heterozygous cross ferro. Um, what that heterozygous gene is, we'll just say Rosetta just for this example, you, you will get 50% heterozygous, 50% non-inheritance. Um, so in this example, you would get 50% Rosetta and 50% Ferro. So hetero cross non, whatever that gene is, 50-50. Number two is heterozygous cross heterozygous. So in this case, we'll just stick with Rosetta you'll get 50% heterozygous, 25% homozygous, which is your Tibetan, 25% non-inheritance. In this example, that would be pharaoh. So hetero cross hetero equals 50, 25, 25. And this goes across the board. It doesn't matter what you're doing it with. Um, it even goes for recessives. All of these basic principles go for recessives as well. The only difference is in a recessive, 
you won't see the heterozygous phenotype. The next one, number three, is heterozygous cross homozygous. So in this example, it would be Rosetta cross Tibetan. You'll get 50-50. They will all inherit at least one copy of the gene and half will in, uh, inherit two. So you'll get 50% heterozygous and 50% homozygous. Number four is homozygous cross homozygous. This one is really easy. It doesn't matter what it is. If it carries two copies and you breed it with another bird with two copies, you will get 100% homozygous. So in this case, we'd be talking about Tibetan. You'll get only Tibetans. This is assuming that there's no recessives hiding in the birds. And the last one is homozygous cross non-carrier. So in this case, we'd say Tibetan cross pharaoh. You'll get 100% heterozygous, 100% rosetta. So um, I can put this up in the comments when we're done. I forgot to get it to you, Terry. I'm really sorry um, no to put up on the screen. Um, but these five basic rules cover everything, including okay. recessives. So if we go back and just pretend we're talking about uh, lavender. So if you've got a heterozygous lavender carrier, you won't say anything. We'll just assume that the base color is pharo, cross pharo. Uh, you'll get 50% heterozygous carriers. You won't say anything in them. You'll get 100% pharo looking babies, but half of them will carry the gene. So that's rule number one for those who are taking notes. Um, rule number two is heterozygous cross heterozygous. Uh, you'll get 50% carrier birds, 25% that express the phenotype for a recessive and 25% that don't inherit it. So all these rules go for it absolutely everything. So if you guys drum this into your head, you will be able to figure out what you've got and, and what you're going to get. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got. <laughs> um, I'd like to go to the um, images, so keeping in mind what we've just gone through. Um, catch a galley from our extraordinary quail has been kind enough to put together some images for us that pretty much just goes through what I what I just said. So wild type pharaoh cross pharaoh will breed true. Pharaoh cross Italian will give 50-50. Italian is heterozygous fawn. Pharaoh cross Manchurian, which is homozygous fawn, will give 100% hetero, which is Italian. Pharaoh cross Rosetta, which is hetero EB, will give 50-50. Pharaoh cross Tibetan, which is homozygous. EB will give 100% Rosetta, which is hetero EB. Um, it, as we go through these, you'll see it's it's those rules apply to every single one of them. You can just um, just go through them, Terry. I'm not going to read out every one. Okay. But this just. This just gives a, a, everybody an idea of what I've just outlined. Ah, sorry, can we go back? Absolutely, go ahead. Go back to the previous one. Um, uh, a lot of people are a little bit confused about fawn enhance. Uh, it's a term you'll hear very often, so I thought this is a good time to bring that up. It's basically just when extended brown, which is your um, Rosetta and Manchurian, have fawn on them. So she's put there on the screen fawn enhanced. So when you put homozygous fawn with homozygous uh, EB, you'll get 100% fawn enhanced Rosetta. Uh, I think this happens a lot <laughs> because a lot of the uh, Rosettas that are posted, people saying, what is this? Um, they are fawn enhanced. So I think this happens, this pops up a lot, especially in mixed flocks. Right.
I like these blues. Yeah, so do I. So what are the, uh, what are you get using to get the blue? What, what, what color birds do uh, you use to produce the blues? I have it in, um, it's, it's an incomplete dominant gene. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a diluter, so it lifts pretty much all black. Um, I started with one single bird. I started with a fawn, a blue fawn rooster. Um, and I put him over pharaoh hens uh, and I got 50-50, um, mm -hmm. 50% Italian, 50% pharaoh and um, about half and half were blue and I started from there. Um, they, ble they breed very predictably like anything except right. for that they have a huge variation in, in shade. They're really quite, a, it's quite a fun color to work with. You, you never quite know what shade shade of blue you're going to get. Sure. Nice. Can you go a little bit into the extended brown? Why do they call it extended brown? It's like a paint palette. Um, extended brown is actually like adding brown to brown already um so the their base is faro i don't know how to explain this if you assume their base is faro you're adding more brown there's your rosetta and then you're adding more brown and there's your tibetan and if you add enough brown you get a near black bird um gotcha. i yeah i think of it like a paint palette uh same as with fawn we assume that pharaoh is the base of, of everything because it's wild type. And uh, if you add a little bit of yellow to brown, you get a yellow bird. And if you add more yellow, you'll get a yellower bird. There's your Italian and your Manchurian. So you can kind of think of it like an artist palette. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. So this would be a, another extended brown, just a little bit darker. Yep. And same as anything in homozygous um, no matter what you breed it with you'll get a hundred percent if you breed it with something else you'll get a hundred percent um heterozygous except if you breed it back to itself obviously right sparkly is my favorite yeah i think there's a lot of people here that are going to want to know where the where the sparkly came from and how do you go about getting it sparkly is just a uh, like a uh, it's an uh, enhancer I'm looking for. yeah patterning enhancer right yeah yeah they're beautiful so once you've got that gene you could mix that gene in with any color bird and come um, up with the sparkly except except tibetan um, oh really okay yeah yeah okay uh, i'll cover that um, sparkly and extended brown are on the same locus. As I explained earlier, uh, I was, uh, they can only have, a locus can only have two, two copies of something that belongs on it. So you can't have homozygous EB with homozygous sparkly. Actually, you can't, they'll either be one or the other. So what we did to test this was we uh, put rosettas with ferro sparklies. Um, and we then took our uh, Rosetta Sparklies and spread them together. And what we found was we either got homozygous Sparklies or homozygous EB. Mm -hmm. None of them had both. Um, so this indicates that they're on the same locus. Um, so they, they actually can't exist together in homozygous at all. And anything else that would be on the E locus, uh, it would be the same same scenario. Gotcha. This is a fun one too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you guys have this in uh, the US. Uh, it's very series, similar. To, yeah, it's very similar to to fee on um, fawn. But it's uh, this is recessive, uh, and it just actually popped up randomly. 
we thought it was sandy to begin with. It took quite a lot of testing to work it out. And they do breed true. Okay. Okay, that is the last of our photos that you sent. Um, yep. Would you have any other stuff you want to go into before we start taking questions? No, I th I can um, quickly run over everything again if we want. Um, uh, phenotype, what we're looking at in the bird, uh, mm -hmm. allele, gene mutation, the whatever we're talking about regarding the gene. Locus is the gene location and we just covered that um, they only hold two genes. They can only hold two copies of whatever they're holding. So anything on the same locus shouldn't be able to exist together in homozygous. Um, heterozygous and homozygous, one copy and two copies. All genes have them. All genes have a mode of inheritance and at least one copy or two copies. Uh, a lot of people think recessives um, don't have a heterozygous form and they do, you just can't see it. Gotcha. Um, that's, that's how it continues on to the next generation, of course. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, I will make sure I put this list up in in the comment section uh, when we're done. Okay. But I think I've covered everything, unless anybody wants me to go through the five basic principles again, if they're taking notes. Um. Yeah, what, what are we doing? Ahead? We've got plenty of time. You can go through them real quick if you want again. Okay. Sorry about the coffee. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Heterozygous cross non, whatever that gene is. We'll just call it fero. We'll just call the, the non-bird fero. 50% hetero, 50% homozygous every time. Um, give or take a couple of percent, but we, we just rounded off at 50-50. Heterozygous cross heterozygous, 50, 25, 25. 50% hetero, 25% homozygous, 25% non inheritance. Heterozygous cross homozygous, one copy and two copies. 50% heterozygous, 50% homozygous. Homozygous cross homozygous, 100%. Homozygous cross non whatever it is, 100% hetero. Um, so basically pick a color, apply that to it, and you've got what you'll get every time. Okay, uh, let me scroll through here, make sure I didn't miss any questions up top. Um, guys, if you would, remember to type the letter Q in front of your question, because uh, I go through these pretty quick. Um, I just look for the Q, I don't read all the comments. Okay, first uh, question here is from Brian Cruz. It says, tomorrow, would you walk through the process of taking pharaohs from a mixed pen uh, containing white, tuxedo, Tibetan, and pharaoh uh, to breeding for 100% pharaohs? Look for the ones that have the least white, for starters, uh, preferably no white, obviously. Um, if you started with only one pharaoh and you had rosettas or something else or even fawn anything else that doesn't have white that'd be where you'd start because both rosetta and italian are going to give you more pharaohs um, so if i for example only had one pharaoh hen and i desperately wanted more I, and say i had a rosetta rooster that didn't have any white i'd pick him because they're, they're going to give you a good percentage of pharaohs. Mm -hmm. um, so just pick what you want, pick what's closest to what you're aiming for, and then just keep doing it. Pharaoh's quite easy to clean up, especially with white. Um, right. They don't like white. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anybody who has ever tried to deliberately make a, a pharaoh tuxedo knows that it's uh, quite a lot of work. So they will it will naturally breed out quite quickly within a couple of generations. Okay. I don't know why. I've tried very hard to make um, some nice ferro tuxedos and I failed miserably. So <laughs> <laughs> I've had the opposite problem. <laughs> okay. okay, Klaus says, oh my God, the queen of genetics is here. 
Uh, so I do have a question. What's the difference between enhanced and based? And how do they work in breeding? Also, what's your goal for this year? Uh, GR from Holland. Enhanced is anything that affects a color that it's on. Um, so Rosetta with fawn enhancement still looks like Rosetta, but it uh, the fawn gives a more compact pattern on them and it gives them more red. So it, they kind of blend together, which is exactly what autosomal incomplete dominant genes do. Um, yeah, they, they blend together and it enhancement is just the term that's that's commonly used. Um, I, I don't particularly like fawn enhanced Rosetta, I've got to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, Sparkly does the same thing. It enhances whatever it's on. Uh, and the base color, well, everything has wild type at the core. Um, it's, it's there under everything. So technically there's really only one base color, but um, other than that, we refer to other colors that ex can exist on their own as base colors, um, which would just be fawn and extended brown. You can just have them with nothing else. Whereas like uh, dotted white, it always has a, another color that has to accompany it. Even if you can't see it, um, sparkly is always on something. Uh, and my goals for this year, I uh, have, I'm trying to get a group of confirmed Manchurian sparklies together homozygous sparklies which is a very difficult process because they do not look any different <laughs> um, I have managed to get two together uh, I tested them with Faro um, and after our little talk just now we all know what would happen I would get a hundred percent Italian sparklies which is exactly what happened um, so I, I managed to get two together so far so I'm going to work on that and I'm going to work on introducing Sandy, Oz Sandy to um, Extended Brown. Uh, and I'm also wor working on the Splashes, which is the um, new Australian white mutation. Right. That we've, we've spearheaded um, all the testing on that and that's been great fun, but i am um, got a bit more that I want to do with them. Nice. Uh, Brody says, what's the rarest quail? And I think he's talking about color. Uh, in Australia, it'd be calico. Absolutely, nearly impossible to get hold of. What's that again? Uh, I'm not calico. Oh, calicos. Okay. Yep. Yeah, um, I've been trying to get hold of calico in Australia for six years. Just have had no luck, and you'd <laughs> probably be able to answer for the US. I'd say it's probably cinnamon. Would you say? Quite, is quite know. rare <laughs> universally um, true cinnamon I know William has um, cinnamon mm -hmm. but yeah I mean there's also people who probably have some goodies hidden away that aren't using the internet and telling us what they've got so sure. it's probably impossible to know sure. okay Allie from uh, Compendi Quail Farm says hello there lovely Tamara Allie here I'm wondering what your biggest challenge was when you created your Oz Snowies. They are so incredibly stunning, so they must have been quite the process. Yeah, uh, it's a recessive that popped up from my sparklies. Now, as far as I know, I've had sparklies. I'm for one of the longest owners of sparklies in, in Australia. Um, I can't find anybody that had them before I did. Uh, and I had a pen of heterozygous uh, Italian sparklies and one hatch I got three snowies and that had never happened before and prior to that you can use sandy over fawn to get something very similar but obviously that's not recessive um, and these were clearly not sandy so I was pretty confused <laughs> um, I, I'd never seen it as snowy before I'd only seen them online as fee um, so unfortunately the first go I actually got all hens all three of them were hens so I bred them to a plain uh, Manchurian rooster and nothing happened all I got were 
um, Italian and Manchurian. Mm. So I figured out it was recessive that way. And then I had to cross those back to finally get it to express as a phenotype. Um, and then I just started putting them together and figured out that it was recessive and that it breeds true and, and all that. And that it was its own gene and I hadn't accidentally mixed up Sandy somewhere along the line. Right. <laughs> Okay, um, Isaiah says, how much do you make out of this, I want to begin quail farming? I guess, how much money does he make? Me? I make nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I make, I I make, make enough, enough to pay for my... I make enough to buy the grain. That's, <laughs> That's right. about it. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, John says, <laughs> are the different color quail mainly from the Caternix quail? Uh, no, well... Catenix japonica is just one of um, quite a few species uh, right. variants of of Caternix, um, and I'm pretty sure they're all they've all got quite a lot of mutations in them. Um, Chinesis and and all that. Uh, I know a lot of color breeders also have them. Uh, so no, that they've all got their own mutants mutations. Uh, Unity Johnson says, although not color related, I would like to know if size of eggs indicates the size of an adult bird that hatches from it. No, nope. absolutely not. I um, breed bantams and they lay a decent sized egg mm -hmm. um, for their little body size. They're only a handful <laughs> of bird and their eggs aren't much smaller than, than the standards and even some of the jumbos. Um, uh, they hatch on around day 15. Um, as same as with bantam chickens, they always seem to hatch a little bit earlier and um, okay. the chicks can even hatch similar size but they will mature half the size. So okay. no, definitely not. Okay. Uh, Don says, if you could work with any color worldwide, what color would it be? Uh, is there any color that is not available in Australia that you wish you could work with? Yes, absolutely. Pansy um, and Fee. If I could get two imported, that'd be what they would be. Um, okay. I would love to work with Fee, uh, and I really love the look of Pansy. I think they're beautiful. So, yeah, okay. if I could get hold of anything, it'd be them. And obviously, Calico, even though that is actually in Australia, I can't get hold of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, uh, if anybody geez. wants to ship me a Calico in a box, I'd be really appreciative. <laughs> Uh, Todd says, if I want solid black Caternix, what two quail should I cross breed? Um, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys use, uh, is it Grufe? Grufe in Tibetan. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's what most people are using in the U.S. to get their black birds. But there is recessive black as well. As far as I know, it would be incredibly hard to get hold of. My black birds are just pure Tibetan um, and and nice clean Rosetta. I used Pharaoh to accomplish that. A lot of people have admired them um, because they are just extended brown and they are very dark. Um, and all I did to accomplish that was breeding to pure Pharaoh. So I made sure that they didn't have sexless brown, um, uh, no white, uh, you, you're looking for quite slate pharaohs to use to cross back and just kept I just kept crossing Rosetta to my best pharaohs and that's how I ended up with those blackbirds okay. uh, and that took five generations Wow okay Whiskey Tango Farm says where did you learn about the various colors in such detail such as which LA is at play and then also where is it located uh, did you go to school specifically for quail no i didn't i um <laughs> i actually did the uh genetics qualification um for the air force oh cool um so yeah it had nothing to do with birds i just happened to grow up in farming and um i first started with the hamburgs and then i went on to belgian de clays and then i went on to charbo which is japanese bantam chickens and i just kept getting smaller and i ended up with quail <laughs> uh, i just uh, they kept getting smaller and taking up less space and i um uh, yeah <laughs> i like little things so i i eventually got rid of the chickens and just stuck with the little things 
Oh, she also and, says, "P.S. Please write a book." <laughs> I, it, that that's in the works. Uh, yeah, with with a lot of help. Right. Sorry. Um, Marius says, uh, "What can I get from crossing an English white over an Italian and crossing Pharaoh over an Italian?" Pharaoh over Italian would just give you fifty-fifty. Uh, mm -hmm. Italian and Pharaoh. Um, English white is homozygous dotted white. So if you cross that over an Italian, you're going to get 100% tuxedos and you'll get 50% uh, uh, Italian tuxedos and 50% Pharaoh tuxedos. So going back to the five principles, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's all the same. Gotcha. Okay, Katrina says, are there genes for color that code for other things as well, or are they only linked with color? Basically, are there things you could be selecting for accidentally if you only select for color? Yeah, absolutely. Um, every every trait that you have is inherited. Um, so if you're breeding with a bird with bad legs, um, that's not an environmental thing and you can't prove that it's not hereditary, you're introducing a potentially negative trait into into the offspring. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, one of my rules for selection for selecting breeders is, is um, confirmation. It is actually my priority. Um, nice birds from head to toe, uh, and then I worry about color. Okay, Lindsay says, "Wow, those pictures are great. I'll have to rewatch this and make more notes." Okay. That yeah, thank you, question, Katya, for putting them together. She did a great job. Right. Um, I think this is Harry. He says, "Can I keep quails as pets? Do they fly? Can I clip their wings?" Yeah, absolutely. The There's pets that will give you bum pets. nuts. <laughs> yeah, they're handy uh, pets. Jessica says, is there a document or a website that has more details on what each of these types look like? Uh, how do you identify what type you have? I can't seem to find consistent info uh, on coloring on the web. Um, yeah, if you go to um, camillaquail.webs.com or um, Michael from Southwest Game Birds, he's got some accurate, up-to-date information. He's got a great website. Um, yep. I highly recommend it. Yeah, um, there's a live stream on the channel um, with uh, Southwest Game Birds, and it's got links and everything to that page she's talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, scroll through and find that. Um, in my opinion, he's, he's got the best one for America. Uh, mine is obviously more just covers Australian colors. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, after the show, if you can give me that link, I'll put it in the description. Yeah. Okay, Beyond the Border says hello from Eagle Pass, Texas and Northern Mexico. We have quail started. We have started a quail program at a children's home in Mexico. Is there a way to sell fertile eggs so they can't be incubated? Hmm. Ah. Fertile eggs so they can't be incubated. Well, you would just refrigerate them, I guess. Um, I'm guessing you mean that uh, you don't want people incubating the eggs when you've sold them as eating eggs. Uh, that's my interpretation yeah, of that. I yeah, think that's what it is. yeah. I'd just put them in the fridge. Right. They should be refrigerated anyway if you're going to sell them. Oh well, I'm not sure about r rules there, but um, in Australia they have to be refrigerated for. Oh really? When they're being sold for eating purposes, so um, I actually sell mine to the butchers here, so. Yeah, they've all got to be in the fridge. Okay. Uh, Aaron's Acres, Coturnix Farm says, which bird has the dominant color in breeding, the roux or the hen? Um, that, that's only a question for sex link, and I'm not going to cover sex link today because that's about three hours of talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, in all the colors we've covered today, uh, neither. It, it doesn't matter which parent okay. has the color you're after. Uh, it's only, yeah with sex link dominant and sex link recessive, which would be um, ex uh, cinnamon, uh, I 
can't think of any others. Brown, um, Sex and Brown, mm -hmm. uh, Rue, which you guys have got. We don't. That's another one we don't have in Australia. Um, but otherwise, just pick your birds that you like and put them together. Don't worry about which is which. Okay, Ritka says, if you don't care about the coloring, is there a reason or benefit to mix them? No, if you're just breeding for size or you, they're just pets, you just do you. Um, keep, keeping them in a mixed pen, there's, there's no right or wrong. I'm a really firm believer that just aim for what you want. And if you don't want anything, don't worry about it. Right. That's the Aussie way. <laughs> Uh, Brandon says, what about the Sandy or Calico? What are the genetics of these types? Um, San <clears throat> sandy is sex link dominant, uh, which is why I'm not going to cover it today. Uh, <laughs> calico is um, incomplete dominant. Uh, it was actually thought to be recessive for a really long time uh, because it's got quite a subtle phenotype in um, uh, heterozygous. Um, but I think William was one of the ones who did some of the testing on it and has figured out that it's, um, it is in fact not recessive. Okay. I'll have to talk to him about that. Yeah, I've, I'm not sure if it was him, but uh, I know that he's been, he, he's had pictures of, um, of heterozygous uh, calico, and before mm -hmm. before that, I'd never seen that seen it. Um, I I always thought it was recessive, but again, I've never had it to actually see. So, right. Uh, Law of the minimum says, what does recessive mean? It's where you carry the gene in your body, uh, and it doesn't express as something that you can actually see when it's in heterozygous when you've only got one copy of it. Both parents need to carry the gene for it to express in the offspring. Um, unlike an incomplete dominant gene, only one parent needs it um, to express in hetero and then both parents need to have it to express in homozygous. Um, for a recessive to express, you need two parents with the gene. Okay, uh, Whiskey Tango Farm says, why does blue not look blue? I know you said they make, they vary a lot, but the example bird does not make me think of blue. So is it something look, with the down or something else? Blue is just the name of the gene. It does actually look blue on, on brown birds. So extended brown, pharaoh. Um, it just happens to be orange on fawn. Uh, they do actually have a blue hue in the wings. Um, you can't see it in Catch's photo, but uh, yeah, it is just the, like sparkly doesn't actually sparkle. It's just the name right. of the gene. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Katrina says, are there genes for color that code for other things as well, or are they only linked with color? Basically, are there things you could be selecting for accidentally if you only select for color? Did I read, we've, not read that question? Yeah, already? we've co we've covered that one. Okay. Um, a handy redneck says, "What about polygenic birds? Can you have different loci being dominant at the same time?" Uh, not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that's, confused that's, us because I'm confused. That's like uh, the sex link thing. That's a whole nother ball game. Um, gotcha. Yeah, that's that's another another section entirely. I was going to say, maybe we could have you back on in the future and you could go into more advanced genetics. Uh, for the sex link thing, I've got to be honest, I don't really do it. I, I don't okay. care for it. Um, I, I have only done it with Sandy, so somebody else who actually just has sex link in their, in their where that's their thing would probably be a better choice for that. Gotcha. Um, I know how it works, but I wouldn't be able to answer questions regarding it. Uh, Billy Bell says, how do you get Italians? Uh, you need the fawn gene. Um, so you, you can't just make them. You need the gene already, but you only need one bird, one Italian bird okay. to, to start off with and breed it to anything else. Gotcha. Uh, Marius wants to know if there's a website we can get all this information from. Would like to print the information out and keep it in the file. And we did already discuss that. 
One was southwestgamebirds.com. And what was your website again? camillaquail.webs.com. Okay. Um, it and is linked in my pro in my personal profile. If people visit my page, they'll see it there. Okay. And Marius, we will be putting all the links in the description after the show. Okay, uh, Danielle says, is there a reason all black quail don't thrive like other colors? Um, mine thrive just fine. So, uh, so mine. mine aren't black, though. No They're just... Ex yeah. Uh, it may be your particular line, um, Danielle. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like the second or third time I've heard people say they were having issues with the with the blackbirds you know getting poor hatch rates or you know failure to thrive stuff like that but i haven't had any issues i just had a 90 percent hatch rate a couple weeks ago so yeah well my, mine aren't um black they're they're just dark extended brown but definitely no issues with them um i every okay, time uh, i've seen go ahead. somebody I'm sorry. every time somebody is um said something about having a particular color that doesn't thrive it I in my opinion it's usually linked to that bloodline not the color okay Lindsay Norman says what is the fee gene and what colors have it uh, it's a diluted gene um, and it can be on any color I'm fairly sure uh, is that right Terry we don't have this area but uh, I'm pretty sure it comes 100%. on fawn extended brown and pharaoh All right. and I'm pretty sure it's compatible with sparkly um, and pansy as well so I'm pretty yeah, sure when I, when I think with... of the fee gene I think of anatheristic which is like we were discussing earlier it's just a lack yeah. of all colors that, lack of all yeah. colors except for black and gray um, and it kind of ha half dilutes in heterozygous and fully dilutes in homozygous. Okay. Uh, Allie says, how do you feel about layering dilute genes? For example, blue cross sandy, is there a benefit or a, is, is it a benefit or a determinant? It makes me want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 It makes, um, depending how similar they are, like s Sandy and Blue is a good example. They can be very similar. Um, and then you've sort of got a bird that you have, you can't tell from looking, and then you've got to test them to know which, what it's inherited. Um, if they're completely different phenotypes, yes. But um, like Oz Snowy on Pharaoh and Sandy, are two completely different genes, but they look almost identical on Pharaoh. Um, I wouldn't cross them together because you would never be able to figure it out. Um, you know, it'd, it'd just be such a pain. So I personally don't mix my, my dilute genes at all. Um, I, I don't have the time to be testing <laughs> which, which is which and what they've got. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Katrina says, what I meant was does the same gene code for more than just color. I know this is true for some genes in humans where one gene codes for more than one thing. Oh, uh, no, no. Um, I think lavender is one that is um, associated with a higher mortality rate um, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you mean does a color can a color be linked to something else um, yeah in rare circumstances but generally speaking no uh, the gene is just affecting what you see or what they carry okay um, confetti quail says I have limited space do you have tips on consolidating breeders for multiple projects in one pen. Example, feral male with three sandy hens and three sparkly feral hens in order to better util utilize space. Uh, you could try <laughs> you could try AIing. Um, I actually had to do this last year. I did a live transfer of semen direct from a rooster. I was using one rooster over about 15 hens um, and obviously that wouldn't work. He'd 
pick his favorites if you just put him in a pen. So I had all those hens just in together and um, basically did a collection on him, just like when you're vent sexing and transferred it to the hens um, and got near on 100% fertility from them, even though they were never mated. So um, it is a bit time consuming, but if you, for instance, only had one pen, you could do that. You could use one rooster over a lot of hens without him ever actually being in with them. Yeah, um, and you could also have all your hens in together and be using multiple different roosters if you wanted to. Um, I don't know if that actually answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I did last year was have uh, three pens of different coloured hens being serviced by this same rooster and I moved him up each day. So I only had one rooster and he was covering 15 hens as well. Um, but he never was in the same pen for more than a day. I just kept moving him up. So over the course of six days, he'd visit all the pens twice and then he'd have a day off. Gotcha. Okay, Jesse says, what gene or mutation do you find the hardest to produce or maintain true? Anything with brown. With sex link brown, it is so common. Most people don't realize they've got it. It's what gives the birds the red rim around the neck. Um, if any one of you go out and look in your, at your birds right now, you'll, you'll see that you've got it there. Um, that is the hardest thing to get rid of. Once you get rid of that, everything else is easy. Um, once you have anything in homozygous and it's clean, doesn't have sex link brown, um, there, there is no difference between them. They're, they're all, they'll all maintain, breed the same, breed true. Okay, Ellie also wants to know what information should we include in our spreadsheets when recording information for tracking each color breeding project? Um, I do all percentages, uh, but my spreadsheet is massive. It takes a <laughs> long time to fill out. Um, I do weights at three weeks, six weeks, and nine weeks um, wow. for my jumbos. Uh, for colors, I do all percentages, even though at this point, I kind of know what I'm gonna get out of everyone. I, I write it down anyway. Um, any issues, health issues within a line, I do note down um, if I have any curled feet or whatever and keep an eye out to make sure it's not a recurring problem within the line. Um, and other than that, whatever you're interested in it's it's so different for everybody because everybody has different goals mm -hmm. um, what what are the weights of your jumbos over there on average mine were i don't really breed jumbos anymore but i did have um a very nice line quite a few years ago i had a bit of an incident with a um i'm an rspca foster carer and I had a dog here and she broke in and killed all 70 of my jumbos uh, wow. but they were averaging 450 to 500 grams okay, cool. um, which yeah quite hefty little birds um, but uh, only two survived that incident so I um, kind of just concentrated on colors from then I was pregnant and hormonal and very, very, very <laughs> upset when that happened. I can uh, imagine. <laughs> I, there was quite a tantrum ensued. <laughs> uh, Brandon says, when can we do a live stream about sex links genetics? Uh, we're not. <laughs> Until, unless we can find somebody that uh, really understands it as well as uh, Tamara does. Yeah, well, I just, I don't want to give out incorrect information. Um, right. And because most of the sex linked genes I just haven't worked with, I've only got sex link, sex link brown, which is everywhere, it's universal and um, sandy. And that's really not going to help most people because mm -hmm. I can't tell you anything about um, <clears throat> Egyptian and gotcha. cinnamon and, and stuff like that. Uh, Mike says, have you done any work with celadons? No, it's not in Australia, or not that I know of. Um, we do have olive egg layers here, but to be honest, I've never done any work with it. I have a couple um, that seems to be hereditary, 
um, they lay a kind of green egg, uh, not a, not like it's about to explode green. <laughs> it's like a, um, right, like like an olive color. But I haven't done any work or seen if that's actually a thing or if it's just a coincidence. Um, but yeah, we definitely don't have salad on here. Okay, uh, William Foster says credit would go to Martin Yardley. He guarded me with them. Ah, uh, with the calicos. Yeah. Good job, I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, Handy Redneck says, how many years do you think I need to set aside to attain a black jumbo celadon? And could the failure to thrive of some blacks be the fabled lethal black gene? Lethal black. Um, I only know of lethal yellow. Mm -hmm. And... As far as I know, that was uh, never released publicly. I highly doubt it's a lethal gene. Uh, very unlikely. Um, and to get Celadon I into a particular color, I'm guessing that would take three generations, same as any recessive gene. Um, mm -hmm. Terry, uh, have you done that? No, I have not. I was just thinking about something else while you were talking. Another question I had for you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you that right now before we go on. Um, can you explain the genetics behind the uh, Schofield Silver Line? Are you uh, if I knew what colors they were, yeah. I know that they've got blue. I believe that they've got lavender, silver, and Andalusian. Okay. Um, and there are... I, believe that they might be mixed I don't know uh, somebody who actually has them <clears throat> who's done testing with them would probably William would probably be the best bet for them um, that I can think of uh, yeah I'm pretty sure it's mixed because you know, they call it the collections yeah Schofield silver collections I'm pretty sure it's mixed. which makes it tough because if you have if you've got one that has say Andalusian and blue and they can look nearly identical Mm -hmm. um, and Andalusian doesn't always have that bleed through effect of the base color, the, the solid colored spots that you see on them, you, you wouldn't know unless you tested them exactly what you've got. Some are obvious, like um, blue on its own is usually really obvious. You, I can tell from looking, but mm -hmm. when they've got something else added, I'm just, your head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Kristen says, are there any off-the-wall mutated colors that don't follow the rules that you went over? For instance, in human, we have blue and brown eyes, but sometimes they're a mutation resulting in green. Pansy would be the one I can think of. Um, there is a huge debate about pansy going around at the moment, whether or not chocolate pansy is actually pharaoh pansy or whether it is... Uh, extended brown with pansy because mm -hmm. they are on the same locus and they shouldn't be able to exist together in a homozygous and apparently they can so um, I'm yet to see anybody who claims to have Tibetan pansy to act that's actually proven it um, the ones I've seen that I've had conversations with uh, when they bred back to Pharaoh they got all Pharaoh which would indicate that their bird was actually pharaoh um, and not extended brown. So that is the main debate going around at the moment where things may not be as they seem. But okay. uh, without access to a pansy, I can't test it. And I wish I could. <laughs> Get a hold of William. He likes shipping stuff out of the country. Yeah, I know. He's he's. He's going to get I'm me not naughty. One. I'm not naughty. I, I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know William's going to get me for that one. Uh, KBQ <laughs> says, can you keep a male in a separate cage right beside the female cage? I have a board up between the cages so the males can't see them. I just don't want the males to fight and hurt each other. Yeah, yeah, you can segregate them if you want to. You don't have to, though. Um, if you're selecting nice, calm birds, there shouldn't be an issue having them in together. Um, at the moment, it's winter here, and I have quite a lot of groups of um, just boys together or 50-50 hens and, and males together. Um, they're, they're not mating at the moment, and they're not crowing, and they're just all getting along. Um, in spring, I'll spread them out a bit more into their pens, but 
for now they're all happy living together and even in spring I don't really have any issues having mixed pens um, you know 10 hens with two two males no issues if you're getting aggressive birds cull them that's are, you, are your cages um, like outside pens or are you having yeah all, all really? outside because we're in the outback here so I've got a large uh, flight enclosure uh, I have stacked breeding pens and I also have ground breeding pens. Um, there's enough space for about 4,000 birds here, although I only keep about 120 um, because we are in town and I don't want my neighbours to hate me. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, the La Rochelle Farm says, geez, listening to this just goes to show how little I know about quail. Well, I'm right with you there, so <laughs> don't feel bad. Um, KBQ says, does it matter what size of zip tie you use for marking the males, marking all the males? Uh, I use, I use leg bands. Um, we support an Australian company, so I actually get them custom made. Um, they're called Meditools, uh, and they're quite cheap. So I just use eight millimeter leg bands and I use six millimeter on the bantams. Um, so I haven't actually used cable ties in quite some time. Okay, let's see. Peepaw Philly Quail says, what is the different ways you dispatch quail at different ages and the most humane? Well, that's one that's heavily debated. Uh, I personally do it the old school way. Um, with scissors, uh, I've been doing I've been processing animals for a long time I think I first processed my, my first sheep when I was about 12 <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm a real country bumpkin uh, which uh, yeah so I, I use a cone and scissors um, and I, I do it right at the vertebrae below the skull um, if you get the right spot they'll barely even quiver um, it, it's it's instant and a lot of people use gas, um, but with three little kids in the house, I don't think I want that set up in my house for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Kristen says, is a bantam quail the same as a button quail? No, um, a bantam Japanese quail is a bantam Japanese quail. It's just been bred to, it's the same species as a jumbo. It's just been bred to be small, be small. and they breed true. Um, and a button quail, quail is, is a button quail. Yeah, different. Okay, um, that was the last question in our list. Um, if anybody else has uh, questions for tomorrow, um, go ahead and post them now. We are at 8.03, so if there are no more questions, we are uh, right on schedule for tonight. Um, the La Rochelle I, Farm I says... Hope, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, we, it's We just okay. got another I'll, question. I'll, yeah. Okay, sorry I had to log off for a little while. How long have you been working with quail genetics? Uh, I've had quail for uh, about a decade, and I got into... Uh, I had jumbos initially. Uh, as I explained earlier, we had that incident a few years ago where I lost them all. But at that point, I was already working on colours. So about six years, I think I've been concentrating on colours as well. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, jumbos aren't a priority for me. I, I like my bantams and my standards. So, What's your biggest market over there for quail? Splash. Uh, for oh, me really? personally, it's the splash. Um, I, one of my first ones, I was offered $70 for the one hen, for the first hen. Um, Splash is basically Australia's version of white wing pie, but it, for ours in heterozygous, they look like white wing pie in homozygous, and in um, homozygous, Splash look kind of like a Dalmatian. Um, they're white with spots, not flicks like um, p uh, snowy, but they've got spots all over them, mm -hmm. uh, and they are very unique to look at. Um, they get a lot of spots on the wings and stuff like that. Um, and they routinely have color on the face as well. They're quite interesting. They're like a paint horse. Right. Uh, Brandon says, what makes a panda quail? 
Uh, Pan is its own gene. Uh, I believe it's on the same locus as dotted white, uh, and they are actually, we're actually not 100% certain that Splash isn't Panda. Mm -hmm. um, very, very similar phenotype. Um, as far as I know, it's not publicly available. And if it is, it wouldn't be from very many people. Okay, um, Ali from Confetti Coil Farm has one more question here. It says, what would be the first experimental cross you would try if you had Sandy, Calico, Ozdalute, Rue, Pansy, Fee, and Sparkly? <laughs> Calico, Sparkly, Sandy, Calico. Um, I know that the Quail Man here in Australia has Sandy, Calico, and it's they're very pretty. Um, Sandy for me, I have a soft spot for Sandy. I was one of the first people to work with it. Um, I don't really mix anything with Sandy. I keep them pure. Uh, I just love them. They're one of my favorites. So don't ask me about mixing with Sandy because I'll just tell you not to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, we've got one more question here. Uh, Max says, uh, when doing colors, what would your favorite be? Also, what would you recommend for someone just starting out uh, to mix and get the best colors? Uh, my favorite pattern would be Splash. Um, they're just so unique and just so cool. Uh, and my favorite enhancer is definitely Sparkly. I do like mm -hmm. these new dark Tibetans and Rosettas I've got. Um, but they're kind of just blackbirds. I, I, I like the ones with the patterns and the that are sure. always a little bit different. Um, and the best to start out with, honestly, if you're going to work, uh, if you're planning to work on colors at any point, the best one to start out with, ironically, is Faro. If you can clean your Faro's up before you even start with colors, you're gonna have a really easy time of it. Mm. Um, so by clean up, I mean make sure that they haven't got dotted white, make sure that they haven't got um, sex and brown. Uh, and that's easy to tell. They won't be red, they'll be brown and black. Um, if you've got red pharaohs with red faces, they've got sex and brown. That's what you want to eliminate if you've got a color line. And it is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, William says, uh, great seeing you here, thank you. So. Okay, um, that brings us down to the bottom of our questions. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add tomorrow? No, that, no, that I, I really hope this has been informative. I'm sorry I was nervous to begin with. <laughs> I <laughs> no, won't be definitely. so much next time. <laughs> I, I learned so much tonight. Um, okay, I want to announce the winner of our Tumblr giveaway, and that is going to go to Allie over at Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. Um, Allie, if you could send me your uh, shipping information, I will get that tumbler out to you right away. Um, also, I wanted to remind you guys, next week Heather Cole is going to be here on June 15th, and she's going to be talking about the Winola Ranch cage systems. I want to thank everybody for your great, great questions tonight. Um, and Tamara, thank you so much for getting up early and going through all this with us. Was, you're you're just, welcome. I had, it, yeah. I had fun. There's just so much about genetics. I mean, I, I see it all the time on Facebook, you know, that uh, just tons and tons of questions out there. And half the time they're not getting, you know, a definite answer. You know, people are, are giving partial answers or whatnot. So, um, yeah, thanks well, so much for clearing else, all that up. If all else fails, um, yeah, revert to those five rules. And yep. um, I will put them up in the comments or... Um, Wherever yeah, you send want me that to. document and I'll post it on the uh, Caternix Corner uh, Facebook group page in the file section yep. so they can download because it from I'll, there. It, it doesn't matter what two birds you've got. If you look at this, you'll know what you're going to get. Perfect. Um, it just, this will make life easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Tomorrow again, thank you. And uh, we'll you're see welcome. all you guys next week.